We all practice for the sake of happiness. For happiness that goes deeper than ordinary pleasures. But in coming to the practice, many times we bring assumptions about happiness, how it works, why we're unhappy, what we can do to be happier. Assumptions that we hardly even notice are assumptions. When we assume them so strongly, we just assume they're true. And sometimes they get in the way. Two common assumptions that people bring are, one, we're unhappy because we can't accept the way things are, and that the purpose of the practice is to learn more acceptance. In other words, we're essentially neurotic, as in that old distinction between neuros neurosis and psychosis. The psychotic person thinks that 2 plus 2 equals 5. The neurotic person thinks that 2 plus 2 knows that 2 plus 2 equals 4, but hates him for it. In other words, we simply can't accept the way things are. If you learn how to accept that 2 plus 2 does equal 4 and it's perfectly fine, then we'd be happy. And so that model, the purpose of the practice, is to learn acceptance. But even Freud recognized that getting people past their neuroses would not solve the problem of happiness. He said, leave them to their ordinary, miserable, everyday pleasures. Excuse me, ordinary, miserable, day, miserable everyday sufferings. And yet part of that theory says, well, you have to learn how to accept that, because that's just the way things are. Another model is that we're unhappy because we have a sense of separateness. Inside we're divided. Outside we're separate from other people. We're separate from nature. And all we have to do is learn to develop a sense of oneness, a sense of interconnectedness. And that way we'll be happy. But that's not how the Buddha saw things. His analysis of connections and interconnectedness was actually focused on the fact that the way things are interconnected, in terms of cause and effect, is actually a cause of suffering. And even a sense of oneness, he says, is impermanent. It's, there's a subtle stress in the oneness. There's a passage where he talks about the highest form of oneness, which is oneness of consciousness, in which you have a sense of consciousness as a totality containing everything. He said, even that is impermanent, stressful, and not self. What these two ideas about happiness have in common is that there's a way things are out there that's already a given, and we're simply the recipients of what's given. And so we have to learn how to develop the proper attitude. In other words, accept and try to find oneness within the way things are. But the Buddha's take on things is different. Reality is not only a given. We're shapers of our reality. We have an active role in shaping the every present moment that we experience. Now, the present moment is not entirely plastic, entirely responsive to everything we want out of it. Some of it is formed by influences coming in from the past, but part of it comes from our intentions in the present moment. In this way, we're both producers and consumers. We produce our suffering and then we consume our suffering. We produce our pleasures and we consume our pleasures. And understanding that point helps open the road to a, a deeper happiness. Because there is a happiness, the Buddha said, that is not produced and is not consumed. It just simply is. But the way we keep feeding on the happiness that we produce 
gets in the way. So for him, the purpose of the meditation is not to celebrate oneness or to celebrate acceptance. It's to develop two very different kinds of emotions, disenchantment and dispassion. The word disenchantment, nebida, also means revulsion, which may sound strong, but it is strong. What it's connected to is the fact that we're constantly feeding on things. That's the Buddha's analysis of suffering. The word upadana, which means clinging, also means the act of eating, the act of taking sustenance. He says that lies at the essence of suffering, stress. So what we have to learn how to do is look at the things we feed on until we develop a sense that we don't want to feed on them anymore. Now to get to that point, the Buddha does have us develop a certain amount of acceptance and a certain try to develop a certain sense of oneness. This is what the practice of concentration is all about. You start by focusing on one object, like the breath. And then you stay with it long enough until you start developing a sense of oneness with the breath. It seems like your awareness of the breath and the breath become one and the same thing. There's a sense of unification. And the Buddha actually has us develop that as much as possible. And has us take it that sense of oneness as far as it can go through the levels of concentration. Why is that? Because he wants us to feed on that and start looking at the other things we've been feeding on. We realize that this is a much more refined pleasure. There's no blame in the pleasure that comes from just focusing your mind. And the pleasures we get from things outside, there's a certain amount of what you might call blame, in the sense that our taking pleasure means that other people have to work or have to suffer in one way or another. Other people, other animals. Just like external food. As we eat, we're getting pleasure, but to get that food to our plate required a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice. So as the Buddha said, that's a pleasure that does contain some blame. Or in a John Lee's image, it contains some karmic debts. Or is the pleasure that comes simply from learning how to focus on your breath is not placing a burden on anybody. And so it's a type of food for the mind that you want to develop. And as you develop a sense of oneness with this food, then you look at the other ways the mind has been feeding on things for its emotional pleasures, and you realize that they're, they're pretty miserable. The image the Buddha gives in the canon is of a blind person who's been given a soil, oily rag by someone who says, look, this is a nice white piece of cloth. And the, the blind person gets very possessive of that oily rag, thinking that it's a nice white, clean piece of cloth. But then as someone eventually cures that blind person of his blindness, and he can start seeing, and the first thing he looks at is that cloth, and he realizes it's not nice, white, and clean, it's dirty and oiled, oily. He says, wow, I was really fooled by that guy. In the same way, the Buddha says, you know, once you attain the first taste of awakening, you look back on your old pleasures and you realize how you've been fo fooled by the mind. That in finding your pleasure, what you, you've been feeding on was just simply forms and feelings and perceptions and thought constructs and consciousness which, when you really look at them very carefully, are not really that substantial at all. Or you might make an analogy with stories that tell about the American occupation of Japan after World War II. There were some cooks in Japanese restaurants who were really up upset by the fact they had lost this war. And now they had to prepare food for the occupiers. So they would take human excrement and they would learn how to prepare it with all kinds of 
wasabi or whatever to mask the taste and then feed the occupiers shit, basically. And the occupiers didn't know. So they got their perverse pleasure that way. You look at what you've been taking as food for the mind, you realize that it really is just nothing. That it's all in the preparation. They made it seem attractive. This is why we have contemplation of the 32 parts of the body, analyzing things in terms of the aggregates, in terms of the sense media, in terms of the properties, to realize that this food we've been feeding on is really not all that much. It doesn't really give us any real sustenance. And the pleasure we get out of it is certainly not worth all the effort that goes into dressing it up, preparing it. The purpose of this is to gain that sense of disenchantment, of maybe that revulsion with the food we've been having, so you don't want to eat it anymore. Then when you decide you don't want to eat it, then you look around at the fact that you've been preparing this food all along, and you don't want to prepare it. That's dispassion. You've had a passion for creating this food out of form, feeling, whatever. And because you've been creating it, once you gain a sense of dispassion for it and you stop creating it, that's when you experience cessation. The mind is no longer entangled either in the process of production or in the process of consumption. And that's when it's freed, and that's when it opens to the happiness that is there, when you're not so wound up or enthralled in production and consumption of all these miserable forms of food. So the Buddha's take on true happiness is very different from a lot of the assumptions we tend to bring. So it's good to keep this in mind. We're all we're producers and consumers at the same time, and it's the producing and consuming of our ordinary pleasures or even some of our more refined pleasures that's getting getting in the way of realizing happiness. It goes beyond all this. That's not dependent on being connected or unconnected. It's not dependent on accepting or not accepting. It's just there. But we do develop a sense of disconnect with our old enthrallments. And we do decide not to accept the way things have been. So it's a very different approach to where true happiness is going to be found. But the happiness that comes is a lot truer than anything that can come. Simply learning how to accept things, learning how to become one with things. So try to keep this point in mind, that you're both a producer and a consumer. And look at what you've been producing. Look at all the effort that goes into producing happiness out of this body we have, out of feelings and perceptions and thought constructs and consciousness. And start asking yourself, is it really worth all the effort? Maybe there's something better. When you can develop this sense of disenchantment and dispassion that leads to cessation, then you realize that cessation is not a scary thing. It's not like extinction. It's more like learning how to outgrow some old bad habits, your old addictions, your old intoxications. And finding there's something a lot better there. When you put aside your old feeding habits, 